And that was the incredible Lauren Anderson and Ben Stevenson's The Nutcracker. I am so honored to have Lauren Anderson here today on my show, Precious Presents Performing Arts. So excited to have you. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me, Precious. Thank you so much for being here. So for everyone who hasn't heard of Lauren Anderson, Lauren Anderson is native Houstonian Lauren Anderson dance with Houston Ballet from 1983 to 2006, performing leading roles in all the great classic ballets, appearing across the world to critical acclaim, and in the process, becoming one of Houston Ballet's most beloved stars. She's in the Texans, Texas Women's Hall of Fame and has shoes in the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. So before we get started, I wanna remind everyone to please subscribe to the Little News Ears YouTube channel, to follow my Instagram, it's underscore Precious Rose, and listen to all of the other Little News Ears podcasts wherever you listen to your podcasts. So first, first question I wanna ask you is, if younger you had a chance to see you right now, what do you think she would say to you? Wow, I want to be you when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that's what she would want to say. Um, I hope. I mean, what I would say to her is, please, please, please be okay with just being you. And you are okay just like you are. Because if I'd known that... Um, I think the road to me being who it is people think I am would be much, uh, would have been much smoother, for mm -hmm. sure. I love that. So tell me about your life before you started dancing. Wow, before I started dancing, <laughs> that was the first <laughs> seven years or first six and a half years of my life. Wow. Uh, before I started dancing, I was a tomboy. I liked to run and, and race every boy on my street. Well, the girls too, but since the boys were a little faster, I'd like to race the, race the boys and play, play uh, I was really into skateboarding, mm -hmm. um, climbing trees and falling out of them. <laughs> and uh, I, apparently I moved around a lot. I guess now you'd call it hyperactive, but mm -hmm. I was just overactive. That's what we called it back in the day, just overactive, yeah. So that's really interesting because I never knew that you started dancing at seven. Do you remember how you felt when you first started dancing? Ooh. Well, when I first <laughs> when I first walked into a ballet class, um, I looked around. Nobody looked like me, number one. And number mm -hmm. two, people were standing with their feet like this, mm -hmm. you know, because we walk like this. But in yeah. ballet, we put our feet like, you know, turned out. And all I could think is, how am I going to get my feet to look like that? That was like the big, the big thing. And I remember... There was this one boy in class, and his name was Eric, and my goal in life at that time was to jump higher than Eric. That's why I wanted to come back to ballet class, to see if I could jump higher than Eric that day. So that was kind of the beginning of my ballet career. Well, other than jumping higher than Eric, what else <laughs> motivated you to stay in ballet? Well, I tell you... Um, that kept me there for about a year. And then after that, I kind of got bored. I'm, be, I'm being serious. I kind of got bored. I wanted to quit. And a man named Ben Stevenson came to, uh, to be the new director of the Houston Ballet. And he taught our class. And normally the director doesn't teach the little kids class. When he taught our class, he made it fun. He made it exciting. And he made it challenging. And the one thing that I've found um, is that you know, anything is possible. He made anything possible. Do you have that one teacher? Think about this, Precious. Do you have that one teacher that explained things a certain way that you just got it? Yes. He was that teacher for me. So I decided to keep dancing. Well, that's great. I know you talked just a little about it, a little bit about it earlier, where you said that you walked in the classroom and you saw that nobody looked like you. But how were your experiences being one of the only black ballerinas in Houston? Well, my experience of being the only black ballerina in Houston started with me being the only black child in the ballet class. <laughs> and at first it wasn't anything. I mean, it didn't, it was just, you know, kids, we're just kids. We just want to play. We just want to do the thing. We're just there with each other. And then I went to see a dance company called Dance Theater of Harlem. 
And I didn't know I hadn't seen a black ballerina until I saw one. And then when I saw one run across the stage, I went, oh, I want to be her. And then I saw another one, and I went, oh, I want to be her. And then it was, just, <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to be all of them. So um, I say all that to say it didn't register to me really until then. And, and that's kind of when I decided I wanted to be a ballet dancer. And when I got in the company, mm-hmm. it was very obvious because their ballets, uh, classical ballets have something called the white act. And it's not the white girl act, it's just the white act because everyone's dressed in white. You know, it's the one where we're all ghostly in Swan Lake, it's the white swans where they make, mm-hmm. you know, all the patterns. Yeah. And in Giselle, they're the willies, they're dead. And they're always some kind of spiritual, kind of, I'm going to be honest, creepy <laughs> thing, right? They're like, it's weird. Anyway, so in those uh, second act pieces in a lot of the classical ballets, you know, you're supposed to look uniform like the Rockette. And back in the day, you didn't break the uniform. You didn't stick a black chick in the middle of the court. You just didn't. Well, One thing about Ben Stevenson is he didn't have an issue with that. And he said, uh, I remember someone coming in and and setting Swan Lake and they said, well, we can't have this black girl in the middle of the court. I mean, she's a good dancer and all, but you know, we can't, it's not uniform. Mm -hmm. And Ben Stevenson said, well, it's exactly uniform if you stick the black chick in the middle of the court, isn't it? Exactly. "Hmm." So that's kind of where I started to fit into the whole scheme of things. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've seen in 1990 that you became the first Black principal dancer for the Houston Ballet, which is such a great honor. But I was curious to know, how did that affect you? Well, I was uber excited <laughs> because my, my, my goal was to get in the Houston Ballet. My dream was to become a soloist. So we have ranks in the ballet. It goes court of ballet soloist principal Mm -hmm. and the principal's the highest rank so I had no idea that I was going to be a principal dancer so I I I, I, yeah I was like (laughs) that right I was just I was like I'm gonna be a principal dancer I mean I was just (laughs) excited I couldn't believe it I didn't think I'm gonna be the first black principal dancer at the Houston Valley that's not what I was thinking I just wanted to dance um the media decided to harp on that which is fine Mm -hmm. because I take that on. I mean, I understand that that was important, especially back then. That was one of very few ballerinas at the top of a major ballet company at that time. So it was a big deal, but I didn't think of it as a big deal. I was just a black chick dancer. I was just dancing. I was just dancing, doing what I was supposed to do. That's so cool. Well, I know that is one of the things that you're most known for, but you have so many other achievements and so many other cool stuff that you've done. But what was the most impactful to you and why? Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. That, that's a great question. Um, well, wow. The most impactful thing I've ever done is have a child, I have a son. His mm-hmm. name is Lawrence Turner. That is the, I gave life to someone and I'd grown I grew up this boy <laughs> who's now in college. So that's pretty impactful. But I'd have to say, hmm, gosh, that's a good one. No one's, I don't think anyone's ever asked me that like that. Um, I think it's what I do now. I think it's what I do now. I have a, uh, an impact on the community. I am the Associate Director of Education and Community Engagement at the Houston Ballet. So I still work there. Next year, I will have worked there 40 years. That's wow. Crazy. I know. I did my <laughs> first plie at Houston Ballet 50 years ago. All that said, I, I get to go into underserved communities and bring dance programs to their communities for free. So I go into classrooms, into uh, science, math, history classrooms, and bring arts integration, you know, movement. So mm-hmm. let's do this. We're going to do something. We, I have a little exercise for you. Are you ready? To the top. Yes. Okay, repeat after me. The water warms up. The water warms up. And turns into gas. And turns into gas. Evaporation. Evaporation. 
evaporation. Evaporation. So I get to go into class, into classes, and do the water cycle or life cycle of the butterfly or, you know, uh, sedimentary rock or all of those type of things in classrooms, but with movement. So that, uh, you know, some people are textile learners, some people are visual learners, some people, you know, so I get to, I get to do that, which is really cool. I also teach ballet in classrooms, um, in schools. I mean, we do all kinds of things. So yeah, I have a cool job. Then I get to teach ballet in conservatory dance schools all over the world. So I, I get to do all the things. So I think that's pretty impactful. I think so too. That's really cool though. But um, I want to ask, what was the biggest lesson you've learned while teaching? Ah, that you, there are no mistakes. There are no mistakes. They're just lessons. You know, I, um, I, I love messing up. I, I, I love like making a mistake, what is called a mistake with my kids, right? And they go, oh, you made a mistake? No, I just learned that that's not quite right. And we're gonna alter it this way and work out this, I mean, you know, there's no real yeah. mistakes. It's not drama, it's just dance. Now, if I was doing open heart surgery and I happen to snip something, that's a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's a mistake. One of the effects. That's a huge mistake, right? So um, when it comes to just being human, we're gonna make those mistakes. We're gonna, but we always get to learn from them. Hmm. Don't stop learning. When I stop learning, I need to go on to something else, for sure. That's such a beautiful message. And I think that kind of ties into your ballet about your life, Plum Sugar. So I want to talk about that. Um, I hadn't got a chance to see it, but from the reviews and everything that's put out there, it looks pretty incredible. Um, but it also goes through all of your life, which has some ups and some downs. So I wanted to ask, what gave you the strength to share that story with such a big audience? Well, I tell you, um, I'm writing a book also, and that's going to come out. And it goes a little bit deeper, but thank you, thank you. But I, I, the way um, our stories are authentic stories, not stories that you, I mean, you know, our authentic stories really help people. There are people that have issues that are going through things. And when you're alone going through something, you feel that there's no way out. But if you're going through something with someone else and you know someone else has gotten through it, that gives you a little bit of hope. Hope is something that keeps, uh, keeps people going, right? There's, there's uh, centuries of people in horrible, horrible, horrendous situations that had just this much hope that kept them going, right? Until they got out of that situation or eventually got out of that situation. So I think those stories are important, they're impactful. And uh, I have found a way out of some really horrible, dire situations. And, and it's uh, a good story, I feel, of um, hope and uh, redemption and, and uh, in all the tragedy, there's a positive, Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I thought I, I, I was just, it, it, the opportunity came to me, Deborah Deep Mouton, who is uh, Houston's Poet Laureate Emeritus and the first Black Poet Laureate of Houston, uh, came to me and asked if she could write a choreo poem of my life. And I was like, hmm. And then she said, in your own words. And I went, hmm. Because normally I <laughs> <laughs> think people write these stories about uh, quote unquote historians and it's after they're dead. Yeah. So they don't get to tell their story. So I had the opportunity to tell my story in my own words and it's a once in a lifetime chance and I took it and I'm glad I did. That's such a cool opportunity. I'm, if I'm not mistaken, it just closed, right? Yes, it just closed. And uh, now the script is being farmed out all over the place for to see where it might go. So maybe it has legs and, and gets to New York or wherever. Hopefully. It, it's just good to be seen. It needs to yeah. be seen. It's a good story. Well, I would love to see that. Um, but what else can we look for next from you? Oh, wow. <laughs> well, I'm always <laughs> teaching. I'm teaching all over the world. I'm always teaching. I teach more so, and I'll be honest, I pulled back from going out of the country. I, I'm into regional dance. Right. I mean, I could go to all the big dance companies and teach, 
They're all my fr- I know all the directors. They're my friends. That's great. But I really like le- regional dance, smaller dance schools, smaller dance companies. I find that I, I can touch more people there. Um, and then, of course, I said the book. And who knows? I might be coming to a town near you. Well, thank you so much. One last question I want to ask is, where is the where is your favorite um, or the best experience you've had traveling for ballet? Oh, wow. (laughs) Well, one that was huge for me was dancing at the Bolshoi, the Bolshoi Theater in Russia. Now, everyone who's anybody in the dance world has danced at the Bolshoi. Baryshnikov, Makarova, uh, Pavlova. I could go on. I could go on. All of the famous people have danced. So I walked in there and I touched the walls and I touched the stage. I was like, I've arrived. It was probably the worst show I've ever done. (laughs) <laughs> it was horrible. I couldn't believe it because the stage is on a rake. It's like this. Oh, that's old, old theaters in Europe were on a rake, and that's because the king's box was straight back, and uh, everyone could go. So the common people sat on the floor, and the people with money sat. And the more <laughs> money you had, the higher you sat up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and. For the stage to look um, bigger and there to be more perspective, Mm -hmm. that they were raked. There's a whole history behind it. All that said, that's one of the oldest theaters in the world. And it, the rake is pretty steep. I think it's like six degrees, which is, it doesn't sound like a lot, but but it's a lot. It's a lot. So your balance is totally thrown off. And I, you know, I was dancing with a famous dancer named Carlos Acosta, and he could turn, and I could turn, and we would compete, and we were doing singles and doubles. We were not throwing out triples and quads. We were, and we were, it was, it was, it was scary. And I'm sure the show wasn't horrible, Mm -hmm. but it just didn't feel comfortable because the stage was such an adjustment, but it was still prestigious to be there. And I feel, still feel very, very honored to have danced there. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for talking with me. And thank you guys so much. I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. Thank you for having me. Please make sure to subscribe to the Little New Year's YouTube channel and to find all of your podcasts wherever you listen to podcasts. Bye.